Hello, hello, I'm Claire Diaz-Ortiz and this is your masterclass. This is Get More Done in Less Time, six simple steps you can take right now to double your productivity and take back your time. Hopefully you are in the right corner of the internet. Hopefully you signed up for this webinar and you are here as a result. And <laughs> you didn't just happen to find yourself here. Um, I am an author and an entrepreneur. I got my start as an early employee at Twitter and as a social entrepreneur out in East Africa. And these days, I'm a mama to three under three, and there is nothing I love more than to talk about the power of purposeful productivity, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So thanks so much for showing up. Just gonna let folks kind of get settled, dust, your, dust the dust off your shoulders, get settled in your seat, grab a pen and a notebook, and maybe some sparkling water kombucha. Let's see, who do we have? As you as you roll in, let me know who you are and where you're coming from so I can say hi. Okay, we've got Tom from New York City. Hello, Tom. Hi, Sandy. Yeah, I'm glad you're here too. Hi, Kat. Oh, Cora in Australia. Awesome. I'm also in the Southern Hemisphere. Hi. Ben. And yeah, well, thanks so much, guys. Really, really excited to, to see folks coming in. Um, as I said, just get settled and we will dive in. We've got a jam-packed 90 minutes now, so I don't want to waste any more of your precious time. Let's start by turning off your phones, y'all. So this is a really important slide. <laughs> Essentially, you've taken this step. You've blocked your calendar for this time. You've showed up. So what I want you to do now is to really honor that commitment to yourself by you know focusing and kind of taking the attention away from the distractions turning off your phone put your kids on airplane mode you know give the little kitty cat an ipad to play with whatever it may be so that you can really take this time and really focus on what we're going to be talking about because i think you are going to benefit immensely from this class today because really what we're going to be talking about is the importance of changing the way you work and ultimately, one of the first ways to change the way you work and to change the way you spend your time is to spend some time learning about how to better spend your time. Sounds a little funny, but it's absolutely true and absolutely worth it. So thanks for being here and let's get focused. One more thing, at the end of the presentation, we have some bonuses for folks, so stick around and you can cash in on some of those. Additionally, in the last 15 minutes, we'll be doing a Q&A, so if you have any questions throughout the presentation that you want asked in the Q&A, please put them into the chat box and Sue on my team is gonna be collating those and then we'll get to some of those in the end of the presentation. So let's get going. All right, I want to start by just asking you some questions. These are, you know, some important questions to make sure you're in the right place and to make sure that you're geared up for what we're going to be talking about today. So, you know, just as I ask these, please let me know your response in the chat box, right? Yes, no, si, sí, claro, right, whatever you want. But let me know that you're here and ready to engage because that that is what I want from this presentation and hopefully that's what you want as well. So do you have more work than hours in the day? Let me know in the chat box. Are you working crazy hard but not moving the needle? Let me know in the chat box. Are you overwhelmed with how much is on your plate? And yes, I'm seeing some yes, yes, yeses coming into that chat box. Have you read books, listened to talks, or tried time management strategies that just don't work? I know a few of you are going to be out there with this one. Let's see. Yep, yep, we've got some folks saying, yep, that's me. Ultimately, if any of these statements resonated with you, you are in the right place. And ultimately, you're in the right place if you want to get more done in less time. And you're also in the right place if you've tried everything else and you're still not sure where the hours go each day. You know, maybe you remember waking up to that blasting alarm and you certainly remember lying your head down on that sweet pillow at night, but you have no idea what happened in those 15, 16, 17, 18 hours in between. Now, if, if that's you, you are in the right place. And you're also in the right place if you want to make a change in how you spend your days. 
you know, wanting to make a change is one of the, the first steps. And ultimately, if someone dragged you here kicking and screaming, this probably isn't the place for you. And I'm sure there's something much better you could be doing with your next 90 minutes. So go do that thing. But stay if if you do want to make a change and you have that inkling that, that you're getting ready to, to do something big in your work life. And finally, you're also in the right place if you have some control over your calendar. You know, I give a lot of keynote presentations at, at conferences or, you know, do some, some presentations like this online. And people often come to me and they say, you know, Claire, I don't know if, if I should be listening to, to this talk because honestly, what type of career do I have to have in order to really change my productivity and change the way I work? And I say, you know, you can have a role or a career in many, many different things. Ultimately, the more control you have over your calendar, the more you'll be able to make an impact. If you're in a role that is really reactive, let's say you're an ER doctor or maybe a nanny, it's going to be harder for you to make dramatic changes. But if you do have control over your calendar, you will be able to. So, you know, hopefully some of you really, you know, resonated with some of those statements, but, you know, I'm not going to pretend that everyone did. I'm sure some people are sitting there saying, hey, but wait, Claire, but wait, Claire, you don't know my life. You've got this little sort of doubts, doubts creeping up, right? Creeping up that maybe I don't understand how busy you really are. And maybe you think I just don't understand that busy is the new norm. Have you had that experience? I know I have. I, I go to the grocery store and I see someone I haven't seen for a couple months and I say, how are you doing? And they say, busy. And you? It's just become this thing we say to each other when we meet. Instead of saying good, we say it busy. If you have kind of this idea in your mind that busy is the new norm, I am going to challenge you to, to think about if that's a little bit of inertia, a little bit of inertia holding you back from really making a change. And, you know, that really brings up this question of what really is holding you back. Is it is it fear? Is it, um, you know, discouragement? Is it that feeling that you just don't want to do the work? What is it that's that's preventing you from changing the way you work? And maybe it's maybe it's belief. Maybe it's this idea that you don't think there's a better way. Ultimately, I, I'd love to hear right in the chat box if you know what is holding you back and also Tell me if if you know what maybe has changed in you to bring you here today, because I think that's one of the most empowering and positive things about you being here is that ultimately you know you want something to shift, and that is the first step in that shift happening. So I want to back up and tell you a little bit about who I am and why I am here and why I am talking to you about this topic, which, you know, 10 years ago, I could never have imagined I would be talking to you about simply because my life was so out of control. So let's do a little bit of story time all about at Claire. Yes, that is my Twitter handle. But remember, we are focusing today in this presentation. So I don't want you to be tweeting while you're listening. And I certainly won't be responding to your tweets as I give this presentation. But please write me afterwards and I will write you back on the Twitters. So this is how I got here. This is my story. Whew, big breath. Here it goes. So this is where it all started. This is the crappy Sony Ericsson phone I had in 2006 that made it all possible. So back in 2006, I had a really wonderful but really terrible, have you ever had one of those, jobs. I hated what I did, but the job allowed me to work from anywhere and it, it paid for, for my life. So it was good, but it was also not at all what I wanted to be doing, right? But this job allowed me to, to live where I wanted. And I had had this long held dream of traveling around the world for nine months. So I got my best friend to come along with me on a nine month trip around the world. I also got her a job at the same editing company and we went on this trip. And as we traveled, we not only did our editing, but we also started writing a blog. And this blog, you know, in the beginning, we didn't really have that many readers, but then it started growing and growing. And ultimately, at the end of this nine-month trip around the world, we went to our last country, the country of Kenya. And we went to Kenya to climb a mountain. At that time, you know, I was athletic. I had climbed to the base camp of Mount Everest and run a marathon in Madrid. And I wanted to come to Kenya to climb this mountain. And someone had told Laura and me, my best friend, that if we were going to Kenya and to going to climb Mount Kenya, we should spend the night at a guest house near the base of the mountain. 
And at the time we did anything, if it was free or nearly free, and this guest house was nearly free. So we said, sure. Now we showed up and it turned out that the guest house was actually owned by an orphanage. And so the elders of the orphanage invited us to come for lunch that day before going to our guest house for the evening. And it was in the middle of that lunch that something really dramatically shifted for me. I excused myself to use the restroom and in the restroom of this little church rectory, there was this mirror on the wall and I had this moment of looking into that mirror and I had a moment that I have never had before and have never had since where I just knew something was about to change in my life. I felt a calling to stay at this orphanage. And I said to my best friend, Laura, I said, Laura, you're going to have to go climb the mountain without me because I'm going to stay here at this orphanage because I feel called to figure out what my role is here. So Laura went off to climb the mountain. She came back about five days later and I said, Laura, I want to live the better part of the next year here. And Laura agreed to stay with me. And so we moved into the ground floor of this orphanage and we began living there. And, you know, in the beginning, the elders talked to us about what they thought we should do with our time. We said, what, what should we be doing to really help you with all our time here? You know, we've got these editing jobs. We've got lots of free time. Also, what we should be doing. And they said, well, we know you're runners. And we kind of laughed because we were runners, but really slow runners, you know. And they said, oh, we'd love it for you to run with the kids, to be their running coaches. And this time we laughed even harder because we're these sort of, you know, average average sized, average height white girls and these tall, lanky Kenyans with their fast twitch muscles, right? And we said, what could we possibly teach them about running? And the elder said, no, you are here. And that's why you should take on this role. And so we did. We began a small after school running program for the kids in the orphanage where we lived. And ultimately that program became a nonprofit organization. And all the while we were blogging away about our experiences. Now, the folks over at blogger.com, this was 2007, had found our blog, started promoting it, and we had a larger and larger audience as the months went on. And over at Blogger, they were doing some fun stuff behind the scenes as well. They had decided to start a little experiment with a new little company called Twitter. And so one day they contacted us and said, hey, why don't you guys start tweeting from Kenya about your experiences? And, and so we did. You know, if you go back into the Twitter blog, into the archives from 2006, 2007, you'll actually see a blog post announcing that we had joined simply because it was such a small platform. And it was so unusual what we were tweeting about at the time. So we were blogging and tweeting and our organization started getting known. You know, this is an image here from Runner's World magazine. And ultimately, this experience led me to realize that I wanted to pursue a business career as a social entrepreneur. So I went to business school, and it was while I was at business school at Oxford that Viz Stone, one of the co-founders of Twitter, and I sat down when he was visiting England, and he said, why don't you come to Twitter, come to our little small company, and start working with looking at how technology can really do good. And so I did. I joined the company and I spent five and a half amazing years there working with all manner of wonderful people. I worked on a number of interesting uh, for good philanthropic campaigns with large celebrities. I helped get Warren Buffett onto the platform. And in my biggest career highlight, I spent a year working with the Vatican to get Pope Benedict to start tweeting. Uh, this is a picture from the day that the Pope launched their first Twitter account. Now they have a number of them. This is Pope Benedict. That's me in my ponytail. I look about 12. I was actually 31. I'm standing next to a journalist for a Mexican newspaper. And, you know, ultimately, this was a huge, huge accomplishment. It is one I will always remember. And things were going well. I had this really booming career. Wired Magazine was calling me the woman who got the Pope on Twitter. Fast Company was calling me one of the most hundred, most creative people in business. You know, I was getting accolades right and left. And at the same time, I was also doing more and more work. I was publishing books. I would go on to publish eight books. I was traveling 150,000 miles a year. I was the definition of burning the candle at both ends. And from the outside, everything looked great, but from the inside, it wasn't that way. Now, ultimately, all this came to a head on April 5th of 2014 when I landed on the homepage of Yahoo. This is the homepage of Yahoo, and that's me, and that's my first daughter, Lucia, woman live tweets daughter's birth. 
I indeed live tweeted my first daughter's birth and became a viral sensation as a result. You know, Conan O'Brien saying a Twitter employee live tweeted the birth of her child, which explains why the doctor kept yelling push and send. The Mail Online, Daily Mail, Employee of the Year, Pregnant Twitter Worker, live tweets 14-hour labor, including dramatic breakdown and a husband who grew upset after he's forgot his ukulele. True story. It was on Good Morning America, the Today Show, BuzzFeed. I was everywhere, and so was my little baby daughter. And although this was a really fun experience for me and something that certainly took my mind off the pain in that moment, at the end of the day, when it was all done, the world kind of came crashing down. I had this moment of boom. And that moment was me looking at this beautiful, sweet baby girl and realizing I was now a mom. Things were going to have to change. I could not keep working as I was working. And, you know, I'm going to be honest, I was terrified of this moment. I had pushed and pushed and pushed for so long that I didn't know what it meant like, what it meant to give up a little on the gas to ease up. And I certainly didn't know what it could mean to be successful without going 150 miles a minute. So, you know, I did what I always do when I'm taking on a new challenge. I began to study things. I'm very analytical. I'm a tracker. I like to write down what I do and when I do it. And so for me, I started with an exercise of sort of looking back, looking back at how things got so out of control for me. And so I started to look at my work hours over a period of a few years and looking at how things had changed. You know, I saw in 2009, I was working full time in 2010, more than full time 2011. It kept ramping up in 2012. It just kept ramping up. Right now at the same time, when I compared this to my actual income in those years, I was not impressed. My income was pretty much staying the same. I was working a heck of a lot harder, but making pretty much the same money. And this, this was the moment where I became obsessed. I became obsessed with trying to figure out how I could change the way I worked to ultimately change the way I earned and to change the way I lived and to create a better life for me. And so I went on to develop a system that we're going to get into today. And using this system, I was able to cut my work hours in half. Here's a, a chart showing about four quarters in, in um, the course of my life. So the year after I really fully implemented the system, I was really able to dramatically reduce my work hours. And at the same time, seeing really impressive growth, slow, steady growth when it came to my income. And you know, this, I will talk a little bit more about how this really happened, but ultimately this came down to the idea of doing my best work and not doing a bunch of crazy stuff and working a mile a minute. So that's kind of a key principle that we're going to be chatting about today. Now, you know, these days, this is an image of of the lake we live on. Um, this is an early morning image. I don't get up in the early morning, so someone else took this image, you know. And, you know, there are mornings when I do wake up, not early, as I said, and I look out from my home office and I see this peaceful lake and I just give thanks for everything that has changed because everything really has changed for me by, by creating a system, a new way to work. I've been able to transform my life, um, transform the way I work, the way I earn and the way I live. And I want to share sort of about how I started to go about doing this. You know, and the first thing I did when I really started to create a system for myself that I thought could maybe work for others was I went ahead and wrote a book on it. You know, I love writing books. I'm an award-winning author. My books have been translated into 10 languages. And this book, Design Your Day, is one of my favorites. Design Your Day, Be More Productive, Set Better Goals, and Live Life on Purpose. And you know, the idea behind this book is that you are in control. You just have to learn the tools to make yourself be in control. So, you know, this book has been a great experience for me. I learned a lot in the writing of it. And I think it's also been a fun experience as an author to see how much it has resonated with people. It's had kind of that long tail effect, which you always hope for, you know, just last month, someone sent me an image of, um, 
on Instagram, I guess one of the fem- one of the world's female billionaires, Sarah Blakely, who who founded Spanx, read Design Your Day and posted it on her Instagram, saying something about it. And you know, someone sent me this image on Instagram, and I thought, you know, this is so great. And every day I hear from people who read this book and tell me how how it has really changed their life. So I didn't stop with the book, and I then went on to create the Work by Design Summit, which you are enjoying right now. Uh, You know, there are more than 15,000 of you and more than 45 speakers, and everyone is here for one goal, and that is really to change the way you work. And we've been getting some incredible feedback from the summit. I just want to read a little bit. Work by Design Summit has changed my life and my thinking in so many ways. I will listen to these audios forever. I think, thank you so much for this wonderful summit, Claire. There are so many great ideas that I hope to implement into my own life. You are a master at time management, and I would love to learn more from you. And you know, I didn't stop with the Work by Design Summit. I then went on to create Work by Design School, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. But suffice it to say, it's an online program teaching you my brand of personal productivity. And today, you know, the meat of this presentation is going to be diving into this system and kind of giving you an overview of of what the do less method is and how it works to make you purposefully productive. So essentially, the do less method is about taking back your time and giving it to someone who really knows what they're doing. And I said this to someone once and they said, yeah, but Claire, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to be in control of my time. And I said to them, but you will, you will. That's the whole point. The whole point is I will teach you the tools and then you will know what to do and you will be your own master. So the do less method is about changing the way you work. So let's take a second. I'll take a sip of water and you tell me in the chat box, is this you? Do you want to change the way you work? And what would it mean if you did? Tom says, yes, I want to change the way I work. It would give me more time to live the life I want. Ooh, I love it, Tom. Sam says, yes, yes. Kat is saying, yes, 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 yes. Exclamation mark. I love the exclamation marks. So yeah, is this you? That's my question to you right now. I hope it is because hopefully I'm about to to rock your world with some meaningful productivity. So let's get into what the do less method really is. So the do less method is an acronym. Each letter stands for something important, and we're going to go through each of the the steps of the Do Less Method now. So the first step in the Do Less Method, D, D means decide, and essentially what you need to do before you implement anything is decide what matters to you, because ultimately what your priorities are will determine your life, and your work is determined by the priorities you place on them. So a great way to decide is to choose a word of the year. Now, I love this concept. The idea is that each and every year you should choose a word to represent the year ahead of you. And I heard of this concept. I read it in a book some years ago, maybe six, seven years ago. And when I read it, I was deep in the muck of my own busyness, deep in the muck of my own overwhelm. And so when I read about this, it spoke to me, this concept. And more than that, I immediately knew what my word of the year was going to be. You know, I was going through a season where I was so busy. I wanted a family. I had health problems. But again, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop that hamster wheel. I didn't see a path to be successful without that hamster wheel. And so I said, you know what? I need a word of the year. And that word of the year must be rest. Now, since that time, I've talked about this concept a lot, and I love what many of my readers have done. They've given me their words of the year and told me what they are, and I just love some of these. Let's let's share a little bit. So we've got passion, hustle, focus, Sally. So, you know, the name of of your child could be the word of the your word of the year essentially. Hashtag ban busy. This was the word of word, my word of the year in 2015. Yeah, I used the hashtag. It wasn't really a word. Slow, rest, 
hashtag work by design, intention, meaning. These are all really great words of the year. And the idea with the word of the year is, you know, it may not come to you instantaneously, but if you set aside some time with you, a nice journal, a nice pen, some coffee, and 20 minutes in silence, and just sort of brainstorm, a few words will likely come up to the surface. Then what I'd encourage you to do is that then over the course of a week or two, say, sort of throw a few of those words around in your mind, roll them around, and see what you think most makes sense. Then try one on for size. You know, you can always change it later, but trying one and seeing if that feels like the right word for you is the best way to go. And you know, it's really important here to explain that a word of the year does not have to be something you choose on January 1st at all. First of all, it can be a word of a season, so you could choose it for a season of life. And more importantly, you could choose it at any time throughout the course of the year. So really remember that um, a word of the year is, is a word for you for now. So that's one key way to go about deciding what matters. Another key, key way to go about deciding what matters is to start setting SMART goals. Now, SMART goals, that's another acronym, not one I came up with this time. Paul Allen is the um, creator of the SMART goals framework. And a SMART goal is essentially a goal that is specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely. So I want to go through an example of what this looks like and what it means to set a SMART goal. So I'm a big believer in goals, and as a result, I I get lots of goals sent to me from from readers and people that come to my speeches, and they say, what do you think of this goal for the year ahead? What do you think of this goal? And one goal that I see again and again and again is the goal to read more. Now, it's a great goal. The only problem is it's not smart. It is not specific. It is not measurable. It is not actionable. And it may be relevant or timely, but it certainly isn't those first three. So what can you do to create a SMART goal around reading? Well, I I know how to do this because I do it every year. Let's say you want to create a goal around reading. Instead of saying you want to read more, try saying, I want to read 12 books this year. That is a specific goal. There's a specific number. It is measurable. You can count to 12. It is actionable. You know that to get started, you need to read one book, and you'll have to decide for you if it's relevant and timely. And this idea of relevance and timeliness is very important. You know, for years, I used to set the goal that I was going to read 200 books every year. I I love reading, and so for me, it was a reasonable goal also because I had determined, you know, down to the hours, how much time it would take me roughly to reach that goal and what kind of time I needed in my schedule to make that happen. However, you know, the year I had my first baby, I realized 200 books a year was not realistic because, you know, babies take time, y'all. At least that's what people told me. So I changed my goal to 150. And then last year when I had two twins and all of a sudden I had three kids under three, I was like, this is crazy. I can't read 150 books. I'm going to have to read 100 this year. And, you know, now I'm, I'm back in a more balanced place. The kids are getting a little bit older and I'm starting to read more, but ultimately me deciding how many books to read in a given year has to be about thinking what is relevant and what is timely for this year that I am in. And the same needs to be true for you. So when you go about setting goals, you want to make sure they're smart goals because otherwise you're not going to be able to achieve them in a successful manner. Now, another key aspect of goal setting, which is something that that I firmly believe in, is this idea of creating goal categories. So sometimes, you know, if you read articles on the internet about goal setting, you'll find people say things like, never have more than five goals, or never have more than four goals, or never, never have more than three goals, right? I don't believe that. I believe you can come up with as many goals as you want if they are within categories. So... What I do is I think of goals within six categories. My goal categories are family, money, health, personal, work, and faith. And within those categories, I place different goals. So let's look at an example. In the health category, for example, I have a goal to start doing yoga this year. Now, this is a goal because I've never really been able to get into yoga and I want to. So I need to set a goal to make that start happening. Now, at the same time, I also have a goal in the health category that is to meditate twice a day. 
However, this is really a maintenance goal. It's not a goal in the traditional sense because I've already been able to turn it into a habit. So this is really why I like goal categories because they allow you to organize maintenance goals, which are goals that have essentially already become habits, into a way where you can track them to make sure you're on track, but you don't necessarily have to push yourself to do anything. I'm already in a habit of meditating twice a day. So for me, it's just a maintenance goal. So overall, this concept of goal categories makes goals work much easier for you and will allow you to understand your goals at a glance in a much, much easier framework. Okay, so we've looked at deciding what's important, and now we need to look at organizing your life around what those priorities are. And the first way we look at organizing, the first step in this, is L, limiting your work to your best 20%. And this step in the process is based on the 80-20 rule. Now, the 80-20 rule posits that 80% of the effort you put into something reaps you only 20% of the results which is pretty depressing when you think about it. You put all this work into something and you only get 20% of the results as a result of your work. However, the opposite is also true. With 20% of the work you put into something, you will reap 80% of the results. So ultimately, this means when you're thinking about productivity that you need to think about those 20% activities that you do that give you the vast majority of your results. And so... An exercise I like to do with my clients is we walk through the activity of trying to figure out what their best 20% activities are. Now, we don't have too much time in this masterclass to go super into depth in this, but I want to give you an overview and I think it should be good enough for you to go off and do a lot of this on your own. Now, essentially, if, if you were in work by design school, say, which we'll talk about more later, you would have a list of all the activities you do on a daily basis in your work life already because you would have gone through the process of tracking your time. Now, if you're not in that situation, you're going to want to make a list of all the activities you do on a daily basis in your work life. So let's say, you know, emailing leading conference calls, calling into meetings, having in-person client presentations, traveling for work. These are all the types of things you do on a regular basis, right? Now, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be dividing these activities into three different categories. And the categories are, one, things only you can do. And I recommend putting stars around this because these are your best 20% activities. Things someone else can do, and don't worry here about who that person is. Maybe you don't have someone on your team that could do this, and that's not important right now. You're just worrying about if it is something that someone else could potentially do. And then finally, things you should stop doing. And we all have some of these in our life. Many of us have more of them than we'd like to acknowledge. And some of them are easy to, to kind of think about and come up with. And some of them are much harder and require a lot more digging. So let me give you a few examples of what these might look like. So a classic example of something that only you can do is traveling to give a keynote speech, let's say. That is something that only you can do. No one else could do that for you. So that is something that has a big star and goes in the category of things only you can do. Now, some of the things someone else can do. Let's look at an example that is pretty common. You know, a lot of times when I work with entrepreneurs, they are starting to make changes in the, how they spend their time, and they realize that sometimes they aren't spending their time wisely and they aren't using their resources wisely in buying themselves more time. So a classic way that people could buy more time for themselves is to hire someone who is qualified to clean their home or to clean their office. And one of my favorite examples of this is my friend, Jeff Goines. We were having a discussion one day and I was saying, wow, your office looks really nice. And he was like, yeah, it's new. Actually, I knew I wanted a new office. I knew I wanted it designed well, but I, I had no idea how to do it. And so I found someone and I gave her the keys and I left on a Friday and I said, just make it nice by Monday. And he came back on Monday and he had a great new office, right? So this is an example of delegating to someone who can do something better than you can so that takes it off your plate, right? So that's an example of some, something that someone else can do for you. Now let's look at an example of something you should stop doing. And this is probably my favorite image in the entire slide deck because it is so freaking depressing. So you've got this like windowless conference room, these chairs that are supposedly, they look kind of vaguely ergonomic, don't they? 
<laughs> and then you've got this green wall thing. Is that a design? What's going on here? I mean, this image is, is an image of a meeting if I ever saw one. And I say that being someone who really despises meetings. Now, listen, meetings are an example of things you should stop doing. And that may sound radical. And so let me give you a caveat for this. Obviously, we cannot eliminate all meetings from our lives. It totally depends on the exact role you have. But many of us have certain meetings that we need to keep doing on a regular basis. However, there are many, many meetings that can be taken off your plate. And many times, meetings are a classic example of something you should stop doing. So ultimately, I've given you kind of an overview of how this activity works in the hopes that you can kind of go off and do this on your own. But what you're going for here is you're going for a list of those best 20% activities that really you should be focusing the vast majority of your time on doing. And this will also allow you to stop doing, giving you the freedom to say no and to stop doing some other things that you realize, hey, you just really shouldn't be doing. You know, maybe that Maybe the, you know, the book club at work, it just isn't really fulfilling you anymore and it's something you maybe think you should stop doing. Or maybe it's that committee that you don't really think you're adding much to and it's just a classic example of something you should stop doing. So go do this activity and start with this first key, key step in organizing your life by figuring out those best 20% activities. All right, so we've looked at limiting your work to your best 20%. Now we need to look at editing down the time you spend on work. And the idea here is that first you figure out what those best 20% activities are, so the work you really should be doing. Then you place constraints on the time you can spend doing those activities. So the way we do this first is by tracking your time. And, you know, when I first work with people, I say this is a really important step and they look at me and they groan because no one likes tracking their time. And it's so funny because tracking your time is one of those things that it doesn't take much time. It takes maybe five to 10 minutes a day, but people just resist, resist, resist it. Now, tracking your time is, there are a few different ways to do it. The way I recommend doing it to start the very first time you do it is to spend a week or two tracking with either a notebook and paper or an Excel spreadsheet every 15 minutes in the course of a day, right? And you want to be as granular as possible. You don't want to say work and then just block off four hours for work. You want to say, you know, in a phone meeting, on a conference call, doing email, you want to be as granular as possible. And essentially, you want to do this activity for ideally two weeks. And then this will give you an immense amount of information that then you can use to really go forward. So after that two week period is over, then the way you can way you can track your time long term is with this awesome app called Rescue Time. Rescue Time does have a free version. I'd recommend the paid version. It's about 60 bucks a year. Basically what Rescue Time does is it tracks all the time you spend on your computer in the background. You just let it go in the background and it, it you know, it has its way with you. It, it goes. And what's interesting also about Rescue Times, if you get the pro version, it also prompts you and asks you what you're doing and the time you spent off your computer. So this is why I'd recommend getting the pro version because it's basically a really easy way to track your time going forward, which is something you're going to need to be doing if you want to reduce your work hours and become more productive. So now the one you're going to want for your phone, the app for your phone is called Moment. And this is basically an app that will tell you how much time you're spending on your phone. It's not going to give you that same level of granularity as rescue time, but it is really important because one of the things that, one of the traps people really fall into is not understanding, even when they get their time sort of in order and, and their work life pretty balanced, they don't realize that, oh, there's also this extra 90 minutes they're spending each day on their phone. So these are sort of the tools you need to start tracking your time. And ultimately, what you're going to do then and what the, the big picture of the process is in reducing the way you, you spend your time is you're going to take an example of a task that only you can do and you're going to slowly over time reduce the amount of time you spend on that task by, by using these tools. So I'm going to give you an example 
you know, one classic example would be email. So you've decided that for you at this stage in your life, email is considered one of your best 20% activities. You need to be doing it. Um, this is, you know, this type of email cannot be outsourced, cannot be delegated to someone. It's your job. Okay. So how do you create false boundaries on it to allow you to do it in a shorter amount of time? And the answer is, you reduce the amount of time you give yourself to do it. Now, this is a really interesting concept that is related to this idea of Parkinson's law. Now, Parkinson's law is basically the idea that time fills, the task fills to the time we give it. So the classic example in Parkinson's law that I, used to, I like to use is packing, the example of packing. So let's say I'm going on a trip next week and I need to pack for it. If I start packing today, then I can pretty much guarantee you that over the next seven days, I'm going to spend maybe 20 to 30 minutes each day sort of putting a scarf in there or taking it out and changing it for a different scarf or, or finding my Ziploc bag of toiletries and, and putting one toiletry item into a small bottle in the Ziploc bag and then deciding on a different one. And it's going to be a very non-efficient process and the task is going to expand to the time I'm giving it this whole week. Now, in contrast, if I had to get in a taxi in 20 minutes to get to an airport, I would pack that suitcase in 20 minutes. And so you can use Parkinson's law to your advantage when you're trying to reduce the time you spend on your work by doing this very thing. You're saying, hey, instead of spending the average of 20 hours a week on email, which is a pretty accurate average for you know the, the average working person in this day and age, you're gonna say, hey, this week, Using rescue time, I'm going to set a goal to reduce that time by 10%. And maybe it'll take you a week, maybe it'll take you two weeks to get to that number. But then over time, you are going to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it to the point eventually where it doesn't make more sense to reduce it further. So that's really the, the overall concept here of why editing down the time you have on a given task works in conjunction with limiting your work to your best 20% to allow you to start to dramatically reduce your work hours. So we've looked into limiting and editing. Now we're going to get into streamlining. So streamlining is really the, the part in the do less method where you start to implement many of the strategies we've talked about and really, you know, start rolling in terms of dramatically reducing the time you spend on your work and dramatically increasing the value of the work that you are putting out. And one of my favorite strategies within this step is this idea of developing a morning routine. And I'm just going to take a second here to take a sip of water and to ask you the ever important question, do you have a morning routine? Tell me in the chat box. Okay, I'm seeing some I'm seeing some yeses. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. I'm seeing some no's. And that's awesome because if if you're a no, you're in the right place. Okay, so I want to walk you through my morning routine. Oh, I forgot to take us from my water. And I said I was going to. Mm. Okay. So I want to walk you through my morning routine in hopes that it will give you some inspiration for either starting a morning routine or transforming the one you have now. So my morning routine is called the present principle, and it's something I've been doing for oof, maybe more than five years now. And, you know, it's funny, it's another acronym. And this acronym came about because I really noticed that over the period of many months, I was trying to remind myself to do a series of things. And so finally, I sat down and I said, hey, you know, if I actually write these things out, they could actually write, you know, these things out well, they could actually spell the word present. And this would remind me to do these things each morning. So that's how that came about. So this is what my morning routine looks like. And a morning routine, you know, I think it's important to say at the outset, it can either happen when you first wake up or right before you start your work. So it's very important to remember that. And it's also very important to remember that a morning routine does not depend on you getting up at 5 a.m. I am not an early riser, and that's the very reason I resisted having a morning routine for so long. So the first step in my morning routine is praying or pausing. So this is really a moment of silence and centering and really getting in touch with myself. And this is the first step for me. Next, I do some reading. I usually have a couple different things I'm reading at the same time. Usually there's something, some business book, and usually there's something with some sort of spiritual or motivational direction at the same time. 
Then I get into expressing. Expressing for me is about handwriting in a journal. My goal is two pages, and it's really just sharing all those thoughts that are in my mind, all those things that I can't get out of my head, those worries and those fears, and and those 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 thoughts of gratitude as well. So it's really just getting it all out so that your brain feels clear. And then after that, it's about scheduling. And so going in and looking at my day, looking at what I already have planned and blocked out, and then creating a plan for the other key tasks that are on my calendar for that day. And now the next few steps in the present principle for me are not things I do in the morning necessarily for various reasons. Uh, one of those reasons being that I you know, now have three kids under three, so I sometimes need to fit in things to other times during the day. But, you know, exercise is one of those. Exercise used to be something I always did in the morning. Now it doesn't work in my daily routine as well to always do it in the morning, but it's something that is always a part of my morning routine, I like to call it. And then nourishing. Nourishing is something so important. This is about finding one activity that really fills you up and doing it for 10 or 15 minutes each day, whether it's, you know, reading a novel, taking a bubble bath, going on a walk, doing something for you. This is an essential, essential step in a morning routine. And it's something that many people like to skip over in, in the, you know, quest for being totally productive, which is absolutely the opposite of what you should be doing. And finally, the last step in my morning routine is tracking, and this is something that happens at the end of the day. It's just a way of sort of going back and saying, how did I do today and how can I do better tomorrow? So, you know, this is my morning routine, and the idea here is to give you some inspiration to, to either change your existing morning routine into something that, that better fits and better suits you, or... It is, you know, to give you the inspiration to actually get started on, on a new morning routine. And, you know, I will say, you know, one thing that people often ask me about my morning routine is how long does it really take me? And these days, you know, the morning routine more or less takes me around 20 minutes aside from the exercising and nourishing, which I do at a later point in the day. I know some people that do morning routines for, you know, up to two and a half hours, uh, which is not, not reasonable for, for my season of life, suffice it to say. But, you know, a morning routine is about you. It's about making a routine that works for for you. And I think this is really, really essential. You know, I, I think that if you have read things about productivity or watch things or listen to things before, you've likely heard sort of some of these ideas that the very first thing you do in the morning has to be, you know, 30 minutes of morning routine and then four hours of deep work. And a lot of these ideas are really not compatible with some of our realities of daily life, maybe the realities of being a parent, maybe the realities of working from home. And so for me, figuring out productivity is about being purposeful with what works with your life. And I think the morning routine is very much an example of that. You know, it is hard for me to do the morning routine first thing, but it is something that I do before I get started working. So that's something to keep in mind. So we've looked at deciding, organizing, limiting, editing, streamlining, and now we're going to look at stopping. And you know, when we think of productivity, I think the last thing we think of is stopping. We think of increasing the amount we are producing. But actually, that is the exact opposite of the way we should be thinking about productivity if we want to think about it with a purposeful view. So I want to look at one key way of stopping because there are a few different ways that I teach people in Work by Design School. Um, but one key way is making a great weekend, taking a weekend off. You know, I recently had an interview with someone I was talking, um, I was doing, giving an interview with someone and asking them about their current uh, routine, right? And their work routine. And she was saying to me, well, you know, these days I actually work seven days a week because I love my work so much. And I just went, oh man, it is wonderful you love your work, but everyone needs time off because time off is essential to allowing you to recharge and it's essential to allowing you to go back with more excitement and more energy on Monday morning, much better poised to take on your tasks and to do them with more efficiency. So taking a weekend off is really, really essential. And the way I talk about taking great weekends off really comes um, from the, the genius of this writer, Laura Vanderkam, who is now a friend. 
she wrote a book called What the Most Successful People Do on the Weekend. And she has this idea in this book that I just love. And the concept is essentially that in order to make a great weekend, you need to brainstorm anchor activities and plan those into your weekend beforehand. So let's talk about what an anchor activity is. Essentially, an anchor activity is an activity that kind of anchors the rest of the weekend around it so that at the end of the weekend you can look back and you can say wow we did this and this and this and I feel recharged and energized and peaceful right so now what I do is I take Laura's concept a bit further and I say that you know really the goal of every weekend should be threefold rest should be a goal personal time should be a goal and family and friends time should be a goal right so these are the three ways to allow you to really recharge and find peace on a weekend so what you can do then to make this work is you can make sure that every anchor activity you choose falls into one of these categories. So let's look at a couple examples. If I want to plan my upcoming weekend, I could think of a few different anchor activities. One might be having a barbecue with the neighbors. One might be going on a long run. And one might be having a massage. So let's see, having the barbecue with the neighbors, that's family friend time. Going on a long run, that would be personal time, and getting a massage would be rest time. So those would be three great anchor activities. I could plan the massage for Saturday morning, the long run for Sunday morning, and the barbecue for Sunday evening, say. And those would be three ways that I would have something positive to be doing this weekend and something great to look back on that would leave me refreshed, recharged, and peaceful at the same time. So I love this concept and there are many other great ways in the do less method to effectively stop because stopping is absolutely essential to doing great work, but this is just, just one of them. So ultimately, I've given you a, a pretty good overview of the do less method, and I really want to turn it to you for a second to kind of ask you, why did you show up today? You know, you've heard me talk a lot. I, I believe that something I've said has likely resonated with you now, and something inside of you is saying, oh, you know, I showed up today because of this. So, so what is it? And I, I guess I really am asking did you show up today because you want to change the way you work? Because I think you did, but I'm hoping that after hearing me talk through what the do less method is, you've clarified if that's really true or not. You know, are you ready to make a change? Is, is now the right time to make a change in your life and your work? I, I think it might be if, if you are tired of trying everything you've found in books and articles and internet rabbit holes without success. If that's you, you probably are ready to change the way you work. But what about do you long to move the needle? You want more time in your day to do your best work and live your best life once and for all. Is that you? Is, is that how you're feeling? Deep down, do you know there is a better way? If, if this is you, then I'm here to say that there are different paths to go down and, and different options in trying to decide a, a new way to become productive and a new way to change your work. Uh, what I'm going to offer today and what I'm going to tell you about today is, is what I teach, which is Work by Design School. Um, you know, and as I like to say, it's my job to, to teach you about what Work Design School is. It is your job to figure out if it's right for you. There are many paths to go down, and this is one great one. But, you know, you do you, and I think it's really important to remember that. So you do you, and meanwhile, I'll do me and tell you about what Work Design School is. So Work by Design School is an online course that I've created that really goes in-depth into identifying what it is you need to create a personal productivity plan that will allow you to be purposefully productive in your life to change the way you work, to change the way you earn, and to ultimately change the way you live. And so Work by Design School is broken down into different modules, and I'm just going to give you kind of an overview of, of what happens in each of these modules, what we talk about, and what it looks like. So module one is all about establishing your why. In unit one, we look at what is your why. We talk about setting your intentions and finding a word of the year to guide you, which is something we touched on today. 
In unit two, we look at mastering the art of goal setting. We talk about reaching SMART goals, something we touched on today, the power of goal categories, and the all-important concept of knowing when to change a goal, knowing when it's okay to scrap a goal, to move on to something else, and to not stay wedded to something that no longer serves you. In module two in Work by Design School, we talk about maximizing your productivity, maximizing your profit. So in unit three, we look at the number one mistake we make when it comes to money and productivity. I made this mistake for years. I do not any longer, and it has been a game changer. In unit three, we also look at <laughs> what, if you do this wrong, you'll say goodbye, Felicia, to financial success. Goodbye, Felicia is an internet meme, and I will stop talking about internet memes now. Um, in unit four, we look at why limiting what you do is key to your profits, the key hiring principle that changes your view of money, how to track your time, how to calculate the value of your time, which is one of the most important exercises you'll do in all of Work by Design School, the one thing never to do when calculating your time's value, and this is a really tricky one. It's a, you know, a trap that many people fall into when they first learn about this idea of calculating the value of your time because that's such a powerful exercise, but then they make this mistake and they ruin it all. Ooh. Uh, in Unit 5, we talk about how to use the 80-20 rule to reduce your work hours. We touched on that today. The importance of understanding high-impact work, low-impact work, high-revenue work, and low-revenue work, which is something I think about every day these days. And then we really go into detail in the proven method for limiting your work to your best 20%, which is something I, I gave you an overview on today, but we really go really into detail in it and walk you through exactly how to do it. And then in module three, we really get into working by design and what that means. In unit six, we talk about the secret to focus. Uh, we talk about decision fatigue and making it work in your favor, and, and this is also the moment where you will understand why all those people in Silicon Valley only wear black turtlenecks to work. <laughs> we talk about understanding how sleep leads to great performance. We talk about the importance of a morning routine and how to build one, which we touched on today. And we also look at the power of an evening routine, which is all too often ignored. In unit seven, we look at determining your biological prime time, why working at this hour will increase your productivity two to 100 times. And that is no joke, two to 100 times. 100 is a big number, and I'm serious about it. Uh, I teach you how to murder the to-do list you have and make this one instead. We look at the art of the daily brain dump and why you need a master to-do list. We look at the secret behind productive multitasking how to batch your work. This is one of the most important things you'll learn. How to reduce your time on email, which is essential. How to handle meetings, the art of meeting elimination and maximizing meetings to get you out of that stale windowless room and into the world. How to calendar your life. Use this key scheduling principle to make calendars work once and for all. Calendars are a game changer, but if you don't use them well, you will be stuck. And in Unit 8, we look at understanding Parkinson's Law and how to use it in your favor. I mentioned Parkinson's Law today. We look at how to shrink your work hours no matter what you do. Um, the power of taking back your time, even if you're an employee, which is an essential unit. We look at the two things you need to learn to say no. Ooh, saying no is a tough one. And these two lessons I'm going to teach you about how to say no will change the way you think about no and will really break down your resistance to saying no, which is a huge, huge key thing. A key aspect of saying no is that resistance we have to saying it. Unit 8 will also look at why all successful people still do things they don't want to do. I love this concept. There's kind of this, this myth that once you're successful, you don't do anything you don't want to do. And that's not true, and that shouldn't be true, and I'm going to teach you why. In Unit 9, we talk about why play makes you more productive. We look at how to reclaim your weekends, and we dive into this big topic of mastering the art of the digital detox. There are a number of different types of detoxes that work in your life to keep you sane and purposefully productive, and we look at the different types of these. And in Unit 10, we look at what your time off is worth to you. And we talk about moderation in implementation. You know, moderation is is essential. And I like to always remember, you know, oh, 12 years ago or so I was at a wedding and the wedding was happening over New Year's and we were all giving a toast at the wedding and someone gave a toast to new balance, to balance in the new year. And I remember laughing and saying, balance, 
what a crazy toast. And it is so funny to me to look back on that because, you know, 12 years later, I believe that balance is, is one of the best things you can try to try to attain in your life. And I don't think the way we think about balance is, is right. I think we need to rethink the way we think about balance, but ultimately this idea of balance and moderation is essential. So, you know, work by design school is a system of productivity that will work for you. Remember you do you, right? So this is a system of productivity. that's going to work for you. It's, it's, it's a program that's going to give you the confidence that you are in control it's a program that will ultimately give you time and margin in your life, and it's also going to give you greater profits in your business, which is really essential. You know, if you're going to make an investment in an online course like this, you want to be able to see returns, and that is the goal of Work by Design School. Purposeful productivity is about earning more and living more. So for folks who are thinking that Work by Design School is right for them. If you are thinking, hey, this sounds like the right place for me. Remember, it's my job to tell you about it. It's your job to decide if it's right for you. If this is right, I do have a few fast action bonuses to, to encourage you to make the decision today. Uh, these will be good through the end of this masterclass. So we're going to be jumping into a Q&A after this, and they'll be good through the end of the masterclass. We'll give you a little bit of buffer time about 10 minutes after the masterclass ends also because, you know, the disconnection of cables and all that sort of thing can be can be time consuming, right? So we'll give you that buffer time. So the first fast action bonus is a 39 page ebook, The Power of Working by Design by yours truly. The second fast action bonus is another ebook, The Do Less Method. This one's about 75 pages. This really goes into depth written about what we talked about today and really going a lot further on some of these topics. Another fast action bonus, and this one is really fun. I did not come up with this. Someone on my team did. This is a productivity lifeline. So for anyone who signs up for any level of work by design school today, what you'll get is a productivity lifeline to me. So in your first month of being a student in work by design school, you can call me, leave a five minute message up to a five minute message, and I will call you back and leave a five minute message back. So tell me your you know, biggest productivity gripe, and I will talk directly at you telling you what I think you could maybe think about doing to, to change it. And you know, this is a, a fun one simply because I don't really do much one-on-one -on -one coaching. So, so this is a, a fun chance for us to connect one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So ultimately, are you ready? Tell me in the chat, are you ready? Does Work by Design School seem like the right place for you? Tell me, oh, we're seeing some yeses, yes, yes, yes. We're seeing some maybes, maybe not now, and that's great. You know, remember, it's my job to, to give you access to this program. It is your job to decide if it's right for you, right? You do you. So I love to see yeses, I love to see maybes. Awesome, awesome, I love it. So let's talk about what is your investment. And, you know, before we get into the different levels of work by design school, the really exciting announcement is that if you are on this webinar today, here is a special coupon code to get 20% off using the code webinar 20. And this will work for any of the levels of work by design school. So what are the three levels? We've got VIP, elite, and pro. VIP is essentially the most comprehensive. Elite is the best value and pro is the most popular. So let's start with pro. In pro, you're going to get lifetime access to the full work by design system, which is three teaching modules, 45 video lessons, audio downloads, and materials for each lesson, the 185-page work by design school workbook, access to our members-only private Facebook group, and then bonus implementation videos and Q&A videos. And you're going to get in for six payments of $77 or one payment of $387, Oh, but wait, use your 20% off coupon code to get 20% off. Now, if you want a little more support, really, I'm going to encourage you to choose Elite because Elite is going to offer everything in pro, but it's also going to give you five private group coaching calls with me, which is a great way to access some coaching without paying that one-on-one -on -one price. And it's also going to give you lifetime access to the Work by Design Summit. 
As you know, you know, there's over 45 video interviews in here and all the bonuses. And if you have already purchased the Work by Design Summit, we will refund your account. So no worries there. So Elite is really a way to take a level up from Pro. And in VIP, if you're interested in VIP, VIP gives you the most stuff. And VIP is really about kind of that one-on-one -on -one connection. If you believe that you need a personal productivity coach and a productivity coach who cares about purposeful productivity, then VIP might be right for you. So with VIP, you're going to get everything that you got in pro, everything that you got in elite, plus unlimited coaching with me for, for 30 days via Voxer, which is a phone app unlimited email access for 90 days, you know, and I'm, I'm a big emailer, so, so that's a big bonus, a uh, one-to-one -one personal productivity review from Claire, and a one-to-one -one personalized Q&A implementation session with Claire, and I am Claire, so that is a good thing. So that's for VIP, that's six payments of 357, and all of these can be accessed at workbydesignschool.net slash enroll. That is where you go to get in. And what you'll see when you go, you'll go to this page, you'll click enroll, and then it's going to take you here. There's going to take you one final step. You're going to have to put in your name, your first name, your last name, all your names. You're going to put in your address and you're going to click buy. And then you're going to get an email right to your email right away. That's going to give you the email to log into the members area and everything is there in the back end. So this is an on-demand course. You can work at your own pace. So you choose how fast, how slow you want to go through this process. And of course, we've got a money back guarantee. This is a 30 day money back guarantee and there's no questions asked. This isn't, you know, oh no, I have to feel awkward writing an email to ask Claire for my money back type of guarantee. No, this is no questions asked. Just say, hey, well, I'm buying back. We say, great, give me your money back, the end. So, you know, ultimately today, if, if you want in today, you will get instant access to Work by Design School, Pro, Elite, or VIP. You'll get that first fast action bonus, the Power of Working by Design ebook. ebook. You get the second one, the Do Less Method ebook, and you'll also get the Productivity Lifeline. So those all you get, that's all you'll get if you sign up today at that link, workbydesignschool.net slash enroll. And keep in mind it's .net, it's not .com. Uh, if you ask me if it's .com, I will cry because I wish it was .com. It is not .com. It is .net. So workbydesignschool.net slash enroll. And of course, if you need help ordering, if the, you know, internet trolls are, are eating your order form or other bad things are happening, then just send us an email, support at clairediazortiz.com. You can also tweet me at Claire. Someone on my team will get back to you. We'll make this an easy process for you. All right? So... Back to you. Remember this, you do you, I do me, you do you. You might be feeling right now that you don't know where to start. And you might be feeling that there is kind of fear crowding in on you. You might be feeling that you don't know where to go from here because life is so busy. And, you know, maybe you're, you're really feeling like life is so busy that it's really become the new norm. And what I want to say to you and what I really want to encourage you with today is that I want to say, you know, doubt that assumption. Busy doesn't have to be the new norm. You might think this is how it will always be, but I want to say to you, I think that's inertia talking. I think that you can make a change. And again, maybe it's work by design school, maybe it's something else, but I believe that a change is possible. I believe that, you know, you are this close to making it and when you do make it, you will come out on the other side and you will think, man, why didn't I do that sooner? Because, because that is what I did. That is what I did. I was in the muck and now I'm, I'm in a great, peaceful, peaceful place. So, you know, the question is, are you ready to invest in you? Are you ready to level up your success? Are you ready to change the way you work? And I'm seeing people in the chat saying, yes, I am ready. I am ready. I am ready. And I'm just saying, you know, I'm sitting here cheering you on saying, I'm so happy. I want you to be ready. And I want you to, to take the leap to change your life. And ultimately, if you're not sure, if you feel like there's something holding you back, let me know what it is. Let us know if there's anything we can do to help you make a change. 
and you know we, we're getting to the very very end of this presentation but the most most important slide in the whole deck is right here and here it is and it says oh hey you rock parentheses no really no really you do rock um funny thing about this also aside from the fact that i absolutely love the phrase you rock is you rock was like my password for all my accounts about eight or 10 years ago. So eight or 10 years ago, you would have hacked me everywhere with this password. But you do rock, you know, you're, you're interested in, in changing the way you work, and ultimately changing the way you work will change the way you live. And again, um, you do you work by design school is is one option, one great option. But more than anything, I just want you to find a path and want you to believe in yourself that there is a path. Because I know what it feels like to be to be in a place where you're doing too much and you don't believe that your life has to look like this, but you also don't see a path out. So um, thanks for being here. I'm, I think we'll go to the Q&A because I'm starting to get a little bit emotional about this. Honestly, guys, this is, this is a topic that is so, so meaningful to me because I had such a journey to get where I am. So so thank you, thank you for thank you for being here. So so let's get into those let's get into those Q and A's before I start kind of the the waterworks. Man, I oh, I'm an easy crier, right? Mm. Okay, so let's jump into the Q and A. Okay, first question from Carrie: How do you limit or ask clients or others to respect your time? So this is a really important question because you know one of the things we talk about a lot in Work by Design School is that you can make choices for your own life about how you want to work and how you want to be more purposefully productive, but other people are going to make their own choices. And the challenging thing is that you work with other people. Even if you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, there are other people who you work with. And so you're going to have to work with other people on a regular basis. So, you know, you may decide that, hey, when you're going to write your memos, you're going to do so in a focused state of mind. But your coworker might say, hey, when I write memos, I'm going to do it while I'm talking on the phone and answering email and talking to coworkers at the same time, right? So, you know, when I think about this idea of boundaries and asking people to respect boundaries, I think back to an experience I had when I went on a long-term digital detox. So I do regular weekly digital detoxes and I do seasonal ones for a few days long and then I do like one each year that's longer. And so some years ago I went to the Galapagos and I was there with my husband and we were gone for 11 or 12 days and so I decided I'm going to do this 11-day digital detox. And I basically, you know, alerted all the important people. I, I put the autoresponders on all my emails. I said it would be completely offline. And in my autoresponder to my emails, I said, if this is truly urgent, please text me. And so, you know, I don't have email on my phone. I wasn't checking any social, anything on my phone, but I did check text messages once a day. And so I got about 10 text messages during the course of those 11 or 12 days. And, you know, I, I bet, you know, I bet some of you know where this story is going, of those 10 text messages, only one of them was truly important. And this isn't really the fault of the other people. It just goes to show that, you know, a lot of times what I think is important is not important to you. And I remember reading some of these and saying, how is it possible that this person thought this was so important? They have to text me this in the Galapagos when I told them I'd be offline. And there was one text message that was about an issue with the Vatican, we were about to get the Pope on Twitter two months later, and I had to get online from, you know, a little island calling the Vatican. So there are times when having those sort of emergency backup measures for a digital detox might be useful. But suffice it to say, this lesson taught me that you need to create your boundaries and you need to set the precedent so that other people can respect them because other people have their own priorities and those things that are important to them. So you need to make clear what's important to you. So I, I hope that answers your question, Carrie. Um, okay. Okay. Here's a question from Alice. Implementing productivity strategies is a challenge. When kids ask for attention, when does protecting the boundary win and when does being available Trump? Oh, this is such a good question. Okay. So this is really looking at the issue of kind of that balance between parenting and work. And, um, you know, I have gone through an experience in the last year of, of really kind of changing 
my perspective of a lot of these things. When I had one child, it was reasonable for me to work at home and work at home in my home office. But now that I have three little ones, I really realized that I had to set stronger boundaries. So in my own life, for example, I now work in an office outside the home. Even though I'm an entrepreneur and work for myself, I, I have to make that boundary even clearer simply because it was too hard for me to um, to basically, you know, be mom when I was home and be, you know, Claire working Claire outside the home, because that's really what it's about. I think when, what your question is really getting at is, you know, I believe it's about being, being a parent when it's parent time and then being the worker when it's work time and trying to keep those boundaries as, as clear as you can. Um, I, I also remember a story when I was in graduate school, I had an advisor who told me that, she once had a student who was writing her dissertation and told her, oh, Mrs. Friedman, Professor Friedman, excuse me, um, I am going to have a baby next year. And so I'm going out on maternity leave, but it's going to be great because this is going to be a perfect time for me to write my dissertation. And, you know, she told me this and I didn't have kids at the time, but she basically said to me, and now I realize that looking back, you know, that this was obviously a a crazy assumption, right? I mean, having a tiny baby at home is is not a simple time to write a dissertation. And this is, of course, why, you know, many people will say things like, hey, you know, I get more done in 90 minutes by myself in a coffee shop than I do in, you know, six hours of trying to work at home when I have family members coming in and out. And so, you know, thinking about dividing those worlds and and making, you know, parent time, parent time, work time, work time is, I think, a really, really good first step. Um, so I hope that answers the question, Alice. Um, okay, Tom is saying, how much time do you spend in your morning routine? Yeah, I was saying, I think in the presentation that I spend now about 20 minutes in my morning routine um, without the exercise and nourishment portion after. But, you know, I know people that spend up to two and a half hours. I think ultimately getting going with a morning routine, um, a morning routine needs to just simply be five minutes, say. A morning routine is just about really setting that line, saying, you know, before this, I was doing all that other crazy stuff. Now I'm here to do my routine and then I'm going to, you know, start my work or start my day, whichever you choose. And over time, you can layer in new pieces to your morning routine, but getting going, it just needs to be about five minutes. Um, oh, okay. Oh, I love this question. What are some, I'm not sure who said this. Okay. Well, what are some strategies for calendaring better? I just throw things on. Okay. This is a great question because this is the way most people calendar. And this is one of the things we talk about in Work by Design School. Most people think that basically a calendar is just there to be filled. And so if you get a doctor's appointment, a need for, you know, you got to book a doctor's appointment, you got to book a phone call, you got to, you know, book a, you know, time to, to write the chapter of your next book, and you just sort of randomly throw things on the calendar. And that is totally the antithesis of what you should be doing. Um, calendaring, you know, I think if you spend 30 minutes a week calendaring, you will save yourself incredibly in terms of time and energy over the course of the week because if you spend 30 minutes calendaring smartly. So what you really need to start thinking about in terms of calendaring is batching your work. And this is something we talk about a lot in Work by Design School. Basically, the concept is you need to batch similar activities at similar times. So let's say you have a bunch of doctor's appointments you've got to make, you have a bunch of emails you have to write, and you have a lot of meetings you have to take this week. Let's say those are the three things you have to do this week. The idea would be you would batch those things into similar times. So maybe you would say, okay, all Monday morning is just going to be about doctor's appointments. I'm, I'm not even going to be doing any work then all the emails I have to write, I'm going to batch my email times into the mornings each day. And my phone calls, my phone meetings, I'm going to batch them into one or two afternoons, say, during the course of the week. And this is really how I like to do my schedule. And this is very dependent on one of the things we do in, in Work by Design School is we teach you about this idea of biological prime time. So learning what, at what time of day you are best able to do different types of activities, right? And so this is what then gives you the knowledge to calendar very, very smartly. So maybe, you know, you'll do this exercise and you realize your mornings are your most high energy time. So actually you should never be doing a doctor's appointment on a Monday morning. Those should always be in late afternoon, say, or things like that. So when you get this knowledge, you learn how to calendar. But 
you know, the, the broad strokes answer is you learn how to batch your time. And I will say, you know, for people who are listening, watching this, who are employees, don't think this doesn't work for you. I mean, many of the strategies when I first started to develop these, I was still working at Twitter at the time. Do you know what I mean? So there are many things you can do within the restraints of other people, especially when it comes to things like meetings that still successfully work. I mean, I spent years essentially, for the most part, batching my own calendar around the needs of other people, but creating a calendar for myself that worked within a corporation. So knowing that I was going to only take meetings two days a week, except if there was an emergency, right? And, and always making sure that that worked, even though there were other people within a corporation, you know, seeking a lot of time for me to meet. So this does work within that context. I just want to kind of be, be totally clear about that because I think sometimes people have this idea that, you know, batching is well and good if, you only work by yourself in a turret and, you know, in one of those like tiny turrets in a castle and you don't ever connect with anyone else. And that's really not the case. Um, okay. Another question. Okay. How is work by design school different than other productivity programs? Um, I really like this question, Sammy. This is a very good one. So, you know, I think, and I've said this a few times, you've, you know, it's my job to just tell you about what Work by Design School is. It's your job to decide if this is the right fit for you and what is the next right step for you in terms of changing the way you work. That said, I would say the vast difference between the way Work by Design School works and the way that other programs work is that Work by Design School is all about purposeful productivity. So it's not about productivity for productivity's sake. I have no interest in making you be more productive so that you can then do more things. My, my goal is to make you more productive so that you can live a better life. And, and yes, that means getting more done and earning more at the same time, but it's about building that life and it's about building the balance around the life that you want to live. So I think more than anything, that is the the kind of important, important takeaway, you know, if there's, if there's one takeaway to, to, um, to go with you on today, it's that I believe, you know, productivity at its best is about making your life a, a better life to live. And I think that sometimes when people are so incredibly, incredibly busy, they can't see the forest for the trees. They feel that they're just on a hamster wheel that that will never end. It can be very, very hard to understand that there really is another way. And um, I, it took me a long journey to, to find that other way and to get to the other side of things. But that journey has made me absolutely convinced that anyone can do it, no matter where you are right now. Because, um, you know, uh, getting to the other side is, is, is an incredible, incredible reward. Being able to say, you know, I, I like the work I do, I, I am passionate about why I'm doing it, um, I am able to balance it well with my family, I am earning what I want to earn, and I am, you know, living the, the way I want to live is a big, big thing. So, so yeah, I think that's sort of my, my takeaway. I, ho I hope that answers your question and then kind of goes a bit further um, to, to really share with you my, my heart and, and what I hope that you all got out of today. So um, we're you know coming up on the end of this session. Thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions in the next, you know, few minutes as we log off, you can always email us at info at and we'll get back to you. And we're just so grateful. Um, I'm so grateful to each of you for, for being here. It's been, it's been really, really awesome.